Hello, my name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book review. Today, I'm going to be covering this book, The Lost Grizzlies. The Lost Grizzlies is subtitled, A Search for Survivors in the Wilderness of Colorado. It is written by Rick Bass, who also authored Rick Bass also authored Wild to the Heart, which I covered earlier on this channel, as well as The Nine Mile Wolves, which I haven't covered, but I'll get around to eventually. I liked it. I'll have to review it again before I discuss it, but it discusses the Nine Mile Wolf Pack, so. Peter Mathiasen, hold up. Why do I feel like I know that name? Interestingly, when I just opened up the cover of The Nine Mile Wolves, I saw a reference to Peter Mathiasen, which is another author I am familiar with since I also have his book The Snow Leopard on my shelf. So there's this real network of all these different journalists that wrote books that are nature oriented that I have and you're going to hear me talk about that slightly in this book as well. So The Lost Grizzlies is a book about Rick Bass's and some friends attempt to find grizzly bears in Colorado. This book was published in 1995 and he spends some time in the book discussing historic encounters with grizzlies in Colorado, as well as the most recent sightings, which included a female that seemed to be with cubs. And this book, for the most part, takes place in September 1990. And right off the bat, he mentions a friend of his, Doug Peacock. That name is familiar to me because it turns out that in another book I read, an Unspoken Hunger by Terry Tempest Williams, Doug Peacock is mentioned by name. Doug Peacock was a friend and contemporary of Edward Abbey and ran in those same circles. And so to see Rick Bass talking about Doug Peacock, knowing Doug Peacock, Terry Tempest Williams knowing Doug Peacock, there's this whole network of people that know other people writing about the Southwest. Rick Bass goes into detail about his attempts to find a grizzly bear as well as all the chaos that goes into an outdoor expedition of this sort. For example, the, the car they're driving in breaks down or they don't bring enough beer for their interests or all these different sorts of things. All these different wacky hijinks that go into the search for grizzlies within southern Colorado and they believe that grizzly bears if they still exist in Colorado are to be found in the San Juan Wilderness area. The San Juan Wilderness is in southern Colorado kind of near to Durango and uh, Pagosa Springs somewhere between there. It's a very low population density region of the Rocky Mountains. It gets a lot of snow and is very high elevation which leads them to believe that this, this would be good habitat for grizzlies because it is very unlikely that they would be encountered. Now, some of the criticism they face is that, like mountain lions, as I discussed in a few videos ago, was it Heart of the Lion? Yeah. Um, as I discussed with William Stoltenberg's Heart of a Lion, mountain lions in South Dakota are hit frequently and seen on roads constantly. So at the time, the population of the San Juans was lower than it is now, but there still weren't any grizzlies being seen on any of the roads at all. And the high elevation country isn't that big. There would eventually have to be some road crossings. Part of this book is focused on where would these bears be found so far removed from 
those roads and humans in general that they would not be seen for decades. Additionally, he also covers that the Colorado Division of Wildlife conducted a two-year study of the South San Juans from 1980 to 1982 and found only possible evidence of grizzlies in the area. A large number of digging sites, a partially collapsed grizzly bear den, and a possible sighting of a blonde-faced adult female with two dark cubs. The last sighting was particularly intriguing because biologists found a large number of dig sites and a quantity of long blonde bear hairs at that location. Black bears are generally thought to be unable to undertake large digs, as do grizzlies, because of their much shorter foreclaws. Because of the large size of the study area, the reclusiveness of grizzlies, the large number of black bears, and the ruggedness of the region, the results were inconclusive. It's really interesting, this book, because there is a lot of optimism and hopefulness that runs through the content. This group of people in, the, in 1990 seem to think there might be, and really dig hard. How big are these footprints? How long are the claws? What kind of things do we see in this scat that we found? All those different factors blend together in this book. At one point, Rick Bass discusses a sighting of a bear, which starts with a deer that he is following. A mule deer doe, larger than a pony. She's on a little flat spot in the forest the last level ground before the slope flexes again and rides up on to bare rock. I step closer in the forest dimness and she canters left towards me, then away, and I realize that she is confused, acting in the way I've seen deer and other prey act when they're being stalked or chased by predators. I have hunted deer all my life. I live in a valley that, owing to excessive clear-cutting, is overpopulated by deer and underpopulated with predators. I see perhaps 10,000 deer a year and perhaps 50 bears. I grew up in the Texas Hill Country, another place overrun with deer. Their habits and movements have become as natural to me as air or water or clouds. There's something going on in the forest now, something in the air, a ringing strangeness. I move towards the deer like a sleepwalker. A great wind-weathered fallen fir tree lies on its side halfway between me and the skittery does, which are now only 30 yards away. When I am 10 yards from that fallen tree, which I am all but ignoring, focusing on the deer, a creature leaps up from behind it, seemingly right in my face, a brown creature with great hunched shoulders. It's a bear with a big head, and for the smallest fraction of time, our eyes meet. The bear's round brown eyes are wild in alarm, and mine the same or larger, I'm sure. The bear's a rich chocolate color, like a moose, and nearly as big, an animal of such immense size that indeed my first thought, the one right before fear, is, that bear's as big as a moose! An awe, a reverence, nearly takes seed. The idea that here, on this highest reach of mountain, a bear can live to reach such an immense size. But the reverence, flees immediately, obscured by my desire for escape and safety as I look for a tree to climb, my heart in my throat. The anticlimax of it, the absence, the continued lack of proof, is so strange and disheartening as to be almost crushing. What is there to do at this point but to protect myself, to create doubt within myself, perhaps to keep the notion of the search going in my mind, rather than a two-second glimpse that ends it, ends it up near 12,000 feet? Rick Bass, in his search, sees a bear. He believes it to be a grizzly. However, like that Colorado Division of Wildlife study, the results of this book are inconclusive. They don't bring firm evidence that grizzlies exist in the Lower San Juan. It is disheartening, in some sense, to think that those large predators, grizzly bears, that kind of symbolizes the Rocky Mountains, those bears are gone from Colorado. But this group leaves the mountains with hope. There's a lot I don't cover in these videos because there's too much to cover, really. One of the things about this book that appeals to me is the 
off-trail wandering nature of their search. They're not wandering on well-worn paths. They go off into the wilderness to explore and to find signs of animals away from human contact. That kind of exploration and that kind of travel within the wilderness is the kind of thing I really love doing. And so reading all about it, but from a time before I was born, in a region I kind of know, I got a scar from diving poorly into a snowmelt lake up in that region. So I know those mountains, and I love them, and I want to go back to those mountains. They're beautiful. And I get to read both a book about a region I know, with the kind of exploration that I know and love, and with an author who I love reading. And on top of that, he's connected to Doug Peacock, who is connected to Terry Tempest Williams. He references Peter Mathiasen. There's this big web of people in these books. Everything just comes together as another reason to love reading this book. On top of that, you may have noticed when I held this book up earlier, there's some damage to it. Here's a good look at it. While driving for work, I accidentally spilled some coffee in my lunch bag and I got damage on it. That damage would make it very unlikely for me to ever put it back into the used book system. Not that I would. I love this book and I love the author. I'm gonna hold on to it. I bought this book for six dollars, probably from Coaz. It is worth that money. If you see it in a used bookstore, you should buy it. It is a great book. It appeals to a lot of people, I think. The cover design is by one Risa Blattman. The cover photograph by Stephen Cook. I think if you have any love for nature writing, this is a book you should pick up. My name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant.